We want to welcome you to worship, coming to you live from the First Presbyterian Church in River Forest, Illinois. And by live, we mean that we are, of course, recording this on Saturday afternoon. Now, I will confess to you that I have never before led worship when I was quite so grungy or quite so tired, and Allison Lundeen totally agrees. She said to me, you will never find another female pastor who will agree to lead worship in the state that we are in. And the state that we are in comes because of the amazing response that we got to the food drive this week. We are working with a congregation in the Bronzeville neighborhood and um, Next Ministries. And uh, we put out a request on very short notice for food to be delivered from this congregation to that congregation. And today, we had many opportunities to see food come in. It came in in cars. It came in on uh, hoverboards. It came in uh, in other cars. It came in, in on bicycles. It came in to the extent that we had seven carloads of food that we took down and delivered to Bronzeville. And it has been an incredible, tiring day, but a day of joy and a day of ministry. I thank this congregation and this community from the bottom of my heart uh, for the opportunity that we have had to do this and to share in the blessings that God has given us. And uh, this is not a one-off. This is the beginning of a much deeper relationship, and we praise and thank God for that. We praise and thank God for you, who, wherever you may be uh, this morning, however you may be listening to us on whatever device and uh, watching as we now can share a video. We are delighted to be able to worship with you. Our goal at First Press is and always will be to draw you closer and closer as a disciple of Jesus Christ. And that is why we do this worship today. That is why we have the opportunity to worship here today. It's because of Jesus. It's because of the power of the Holy Spirit. It's because of God the Father. And on this Trinity Sunday, we honor all three persons of the Trinity, God three in one. As we come to worship, I'm going to ask Tim Gamble, one of our elders and uh, one of our liturgists, to lead us in the hearing of this call to worship from the first chapter of Genesis that tells us of God's amazing creative gift. Thank you, Paul. Oh, good morning. Blessings, everyone. Um, and uh, blessings, please, on the reading and the electronic delivery and the open-hearted reception of God's Word, Genesis chapter 1 from the uh, Common English Bible translation. When God began to create the heavens and the earth, the earth was without shape or form. It was dark over the deep seas and God's wind swept over the waters. God said, let there be light. And so light appeared. God saw how good the light was. God separated the light from the darkness. And God said, let there be a dome in the middle of the waters to separate the waters from each other. And God made the dome and separated the waters under the dome from the waters above the dome. And it happened in that way. And God named the dome sky. God said, let the waters under the sky come together into one place so that the dry land can appear. And that's what happened. God named the dry land earth. And he named the gathered waters seas. God saw how good it was. And God said, let the earth grow plant life, plants yielding seeds, and fruit trees bearing fruit with seeds inside it, each according to its kind throughout the earth. And that's what happened. God saw how good it was. And God said, let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the day from the night. They will mark events, sacred seasons, days, and years. They will be lights in the dome of the sky to shine on the earth. And that's what happened. God made the stars and two great lights, the larger light 
to rule over the day and the smaller light to rule over the night. God put them in the dome of the sky to shine on the earth to rule over the day and over the night and a separate light. It separated from the darkness. God saw how good it was. God said, let the waters swarm with living things and let birds fly above the earth up into the dome of the sky. God created the great sea animals and all the tiny living things that swarm in the waters, each according to its kind, and all the winged birds, each according to its kind. God saw how good it was, and then God blessed them. Be fertile and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let the birds multiply on the earth. And God said, let the earth produce every kind of living thing, livestock, crawling things, and wildlife. And that's what happened. God made every kind of wildlife, every kind of livestock, every kind of creature that crawls on the ground. God saw how good it was. And then God said, let us make humanity in our image, to resemble us so that they may take charge of the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock over all the earth, and all the crawling things on earth. God created humanity in God's own image. In the divine image, God created them. Male and female, God created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fertile and multiply, fill the earth and master it. And that's what happened. God saw everything he had made. It was supremely good. And so as we waken this morning to a beautiful world where terrible things can happen, let us join our voices with all of creation to praise and worship God, who is supremely good.
is faithful and God is just, and God will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so, sisters and brothers, in humility and in faith, let us confess to Almighty God. God of grace and love, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we confess that we fail to love you with all our heart, soul, and mind, and we fail to love the people who bear your image in your world. We ignore your commandments, stray from your way, and follow other gods. We do not treasure the earth you created and are not faithful in its care. Give us the perspective of hope that we you, and then help us live fully the life you offer us, serving you faithfully, proclaiming your lordship over this world, exhibiting your kingdom in all we say and do, and giving honor to your holy name. We can ask this because of Jesus. Amen. Loving God, you are the source of our strength, and you are the strength of our life. And so we hear from you this assurance. We understand from your word this promise, that as far as the east is from the west, so far you have removed us from our sin. Sisters and brothers, 
Let us hear these words and take them to our hearts. We are not slaves to sin. We are not slaves to death. We are not slaves to destruction. We are not slaves to the ways of the world. We are not slaves to racism. We are not slaves to violence. We are not slaves to systems of injustice. Because of Jesus, because he is resurrected, because he has ascended, and because he reigns, we are free to be his people, alive and active, forgiven and forgiving, living and loving in this his world. I promise you this in the name of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are forgiven. God is reigning. Live as those who have been died for. Amen. Our scripture this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, beginning with verse 16. Listen for the word of God. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is the word of the Lord. These are unusual times to be sure. As I alluded to at the beginning of the service, I don't think I've ever preached in a worship service in a sanctuary, at least, in a sweaty t-shirt and cargo shorts. But these are interesting times in so many other ways. This has been a remarkable week in this city and in cities across the nation and indeed around the world. At the time that we were recording this service last weekend, we had no idea of what we would experience in the streets of Chicago and its suburbs within 30 hours. But that was also because many of us have little idea of the structures of injustice that fuel the righteous protests. As God's people, we need to separate out very carefully and very discerningly the systems of authority, the things that cause people to protest significant injustice, but also the evil that causes people to take things into their own hands for the rioting and the looting. And the fact that those two things really, in most instances, have nothing to do with each other. We are seeing good and evil play out in front of us, in the streets of our cities, affecting people who we love, affecting the world that we know. Throughout this week, I've been debating about how to preach this coming Sunday. And at one point, my daughter, Rebecca, who is a pastor in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, reached out to me because she also was up to preach in her congregation this week. And I simply got a text one morning that said, sermon consult, question mark. And so we did, we consulted. We talked about the Genesis text. We talked about the Matthew text. We talked about all of the things that are happening in a burning, fearful world. Debbie and I got the text of her sermon completed on Thursday late afternoon. And as I sat in the relative peace and quiet of our back deck reading the text to Debbie, 
I looked at her and I said, I can't do any better than this. Because they also are videotaping their services, I reached out to Becca and said, with your permission and with the permission of your senior pastor, would it be possible for us to share your sermon? That's indeed what we are about to do. Some people have been congratulatory on this. Others have worried that I should be preaching this morning. But I offer to you a sermon that is both elegant in its text and powerful in its prophecy, and I would say that if she was not my daughter. And so now we go to the sanctuary of the Christ United Methodist Church in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, and I cede the pulpit to Rebecca Detterman MacDonald. Will you pray with me? Living God, help us to hear your holy word with open hearts so that we may truly understand and understanding that we may believe and believing that we may follow in all faithfulness and obedience, seeking your honor and glory in all we do. Amen. Our text for this morning brings us back to the mountain in Galilee where Jesus again meets his disciples. This mountain is the one where everything all began. It is the mountain where Jesus preached his famous Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is no stranger to mountains. He was led up a mountain while he was tempted right after he was baptized. He frequently withdrew to the mountains to pray. He was transfigured on a mountain before James and John. And now he's meeting the 11 disciples on a mountain to commission them to continue his ministry after his ascension. This is almost like a graduation for the disciples. Much like several of you are completing one stage of life and moving on to the next, the disciples too are moving on from their current season of ministry with Jesus to the next season of ministry without him. I remember similar feelings each time I've graduated. All I wanted was for someone to tell me what was coming next. And this was outside of a global pandemic. Especially graduating from high school and college, I would have given anything for someone to give me instructions on what I was supposed to do, where I was supposed to go, and who could tell me what was in store for me. And just to make sure we're all up to speed on what's been going on up to this point in the story, Jesus was handed over to the authorities by Judas, was crucified, died, and was buried. He rose again on the third day and now is appearing to his disciples once again. In Matthew's gospel, the resurrection and this appearance to the disciples happen in quick succession. Jesus appears to the women who came to the tomb. The guards and chief priests find out that Jesus has risen from the dead, something they were not expecting to happen. And then we are brought to this mountaintop with the disciples. When the disciples saw Jesus, they worshipped him because they knew who he was. They recognized him. It's interesting that in this verse, verse 17, that we are told that some of the disciples doubted. We aren't told who doubted. It could have been any of the disciples. Even after all they'd been through, some disciples still doubted whether or not Jesus was worth worshipping. I wonder if they were feeling the same way I was at graduation. What comes next? Jesus is back again, but then says he's leaving. So where did the disciples go from here? What's in store for them now? But Jesus pushes right past their doubt and begins his commission of the disciples, starting in verse 18, saying, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Authority is a tricky word. There's a lot of language being thrown around right now about authority, what authority should or should not look like, and how authority has been used and continues to be used and abused for the benefit of certain people over others. We've been seeing many expressions of authority on display both in the last several weeks and months 
as well as in the history of our country and our world. We've seen the authority in the hands of our government leaders as we navigate a global pandemic. We've seen the authority of police both being used to protect and to cause violence, specifically when it comes to the deaths of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, just to name the most recent. We have seen the authority of first responders and civilians helping to keep people safe during the peaceful protests going on throughout the world. We have seen the authority of scientists and medical professionals as they guide us in slowing and preventing the spread of COVID-19. We have seen presidential authority put on display in order to control narratives we are told through the news. And we have seen authority in those voices who so often are silenced as we hear them scream out for help, for peace, and for breath. Authority is a tricky word. It's a word that comes with a lot of meetings and quite honestly, a lot of baggage, even in the Bible. Throughout the New Testament, there are two significant words used for authority or for power. The first is the Greek word dunamis, meaning power or influence, and more specifically, mighty power that is shown through performing miracles or having wealth or status, which today we might call privilege. One instance where this kind of power is mentioned is in Matthew's Gospel, when Jesus is being tempted by the devil in Matthew 4. It says, again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all of the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give to you, he said, if you will just bow down and worship me. The devil is offering Jesus power and might over all of the kingdoms of the world, which Jesus already has being the son of God, if only Jesus would bow down and worship him. Here, the devil sees authority as to triumph over. This kind of authority, this kind of power that seeks to dominate is one that is supposed to be held onto. It is one that is sought after, that is gained, that usually comes at a cost. It is a power that seeks to dominate. I can imagine Cain in the book of Genesis and the officer who knelt on George Floyd's neck or the officers who recklessly fired tear gas and rubber bullets at the faces of protesters. While this is certainly not the only use of this word, it is one that is common and is certainly relevant to us over the last few weeks. We've seen this kind of power used and abused over and over again throughout history. We've seen government leaders, white supremacists, and others who seek to incite violence and destruction use their powers in ways that are only meant to hurt and tear down. We have seen elected officials take the power that comes with their office and use it to proclaim only hate, violence, and destruction. We have seen the power of peaceful protests taken and twisted by a small few who seek to change a narrative of peace into a narrative of violence. And we have seen those whose sworn duty it is to protect and to serve our communities manipulate their power out of fear and take the lives of innocent victims of color. Ultimately, what we are seeing played out amongst our elected officials of those few individuals seeking to incite violence amongst peaceful protesters, and those police officers who misuse their power and fear against people of color, is evil. The powers of evil, injustice, and oppression are clashing with the powers of love, of good, and of peace, and we're watching it happen in real time. Like Paul says in his letter to the Ephesians, our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. 
Quite honestly, it would be much easier if our enemies were flesh and blood, because then we could see them and name them for what they are. But all flesh and blood, black bodies, brown bodies, white bodies, disabled bodies, all those created by God and called children of God are part of God's family and not those of whom we should be afraid or who we should seek violence against. It is the forces of white supremacy, of government systems that were built to benefit the powerful and the privileged that are unjust and oppressive. They are evil and they are fighting to keep hold of their power. They are forces and systems of evil, injustice, and oppression that seek to divide rather than to unite. It is these powers that seek to dominate, that seek to victimize, that seek to capitalize on the broken, that are ultimately doing the most harm to the most vulnerable groups of people. Often the powers and the principalities, the systems of evil, injustice, and oppression wear the coat of law and order. It is not enemies of flesh and blood we are against. We are not against the people who wear certain, certain uniforms. We are not against our political opponents. We are not against those who seek to create violence and destruction. We are against the forces of hate, greed, and lust for power that are our true enemy. God's power, and specifically God's power through Jesus Christ, is the opposite of this type of power. Even though God is all-powerful and has the power to dominate all of creation, that's not the way our God operates. Instead, the power of God through Jesus Christ is passed on to others. In Greek, the word used for this is excusia, meaning power, authority, or permission. Another way of thinking of this type of power, of God's type of power, is a, pa a power that carries forth, one that is very much living and active. This is the power that Jesus received from God the Father and passed on through us through the presence of the Holy Spirit. Just as God breathed life into creation, just as Jesus came in the flesh as God with us and breathed the very breath we breathe each and every day, just as the Holy Spirit was sent and breathed upon those gathered together in Acts as our comforter and our advocate, God's power is a different kind of power. Commentator Stephen Boyd puts it this way, God exercises powerfulness by giving. God nourishes the sun and creation, communicating God's own reality to them. In the strength of that sharing, when Jesus meets the coercive power that threatens to take his life, he does not protect his own identity by trying to hold on to it. He serves us by allowing it to make good on its threat, knowing that his life rests not in the power to preserve his life, but in God's willingness to sustain it. God's power is not power that seeks to dominate. It is not a power that seeks to control. Think back to the greatest commandment that was given first in Deuteronomy and then reiterated in Matthew's Gospel. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All of the law and prophets hang on these two commandments. Loving God and loving our neighbor can only be done from a place of vulnerability, from a place of open arms and not clenched fists. And this is what Jesus commissions us to do, to go out and train everyone we meet in the way of life Jesus taught us, loving God and loving our neighbor, regardless of their skin color, 
their nationality, their socioeconomic status, regardless of anything about them. God's love and God's power is one of giving, so much so that God came to us in flesh and blood to show us what this love and power actually looks like. And if you recall, the powers and principalities worked against him and ultimately killed him. But here's the thing. Because of Jesus, because of the power of God incarnate in our flesh, death no longer has the final word. You see, the worst thing that the powers and principalities can do is kill someone. They can't do anything worse than that. That is the end of their power. Jesus was willing to die. Jesus did not try to protect his own power. Jesus was willing to face the humiliation and the vulnerability that came with open arms hanging on a cross. Jesus made an example of the powers and principalities and named them for what they are. Though it may have looked like the powers were celebrating a triumph over Jesus in his death, it was actually the other way around. Jesus' cry of, it is finished, from the cross is a sign of power that can only come through powerlessness. When Jesus was raised from the dead, and through God's continual offer of life after death, the powers and the principalities have lost their grip on us. The powers that seek to separate us from God can't anymore, because Jesus disarmed the powers through his crucifixion, death, and resurrection. The worst fear of the powers and principalities is to be called out and named for what they actually are. The spiritual forces of wickedness, of evil, of injustice, and from oppression, they only have power if they work in the dark. They only have power as long as we stay silent and ignore the ways in which they constantly seek to harm and to destroy. As soon as these powers and principalities are called out, as soon as they are named, as soon as they are brought into the light, they lose their power. The work of Jesus on the cross called out and named the powers and principalities once and for all. As Paul's letter to the Romans reminds us, For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, neither the present, nor the future, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And that brings us back to the commissioning of the disciples, back on the mountaintop with Jesus where it all began. Jesus says to his disciples, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Through his commission, Jesus is passing his power on to us and reminding us that we do not do this work alone. Jesus is giving us his authority Jesus is inviting us into the power of the divine life that is to be shared with all people in all places. In death and resurrection, Jesus names and disarms the powers of this world, but we don't have to wait until death to participate in the work of Christ. Every time we come to the table, every time we share a meal, every time we meet, reach out to the marginalized, every time we clothe the naked, Every time we protest injustice in large-scale ways or in small-scale ways, we participate in the work of Christ and his commission. Because we have been given Jesus' authority, because Jesus' power has been passed on to us, we can continue the work of calling out and naming the powers and principalities 
that are very much active in our world. We can name the oppressive systems that seek to silence the voices of people of color. We can name the evil that is the Ku Klux Klan and white supremacy. We can name those who seek to turn peaceful protests into violent riots and looting. We can look our fear in the face and disarm it because we know that nothing is able to separate us from the love of God through Christ Jesus our Lord. Because if we don't, these powers will continue to wreak havoc on all of God's creation, which God called supremely good. The world is on fire, friends. It always has been. Creation and all that is in it is not how God intended it to be. Our commission as Christ's sent people is to make the world look more like what God intended. To make the world and those who live in it supremely good through the love of God, through Christ Jesus. May it be so. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Becca, for that good word. We've come now to a time in our service where we get to pray, and what a privilege that is. And I thought I would just lead us through a time of repentance, praise, and intercession. And as you are sitting in your kitchen or your living room or your car, wherever it is that you're watching or listening, if you would just uh, pray with us, and when we come to a, a silent time, if you would, together with whomever you're with, um, pray for people by name. Let us bow our heads. O oh Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We have heavy hearts. We hold on to the truth which we just heard from your word and from Becca. You are indeed the hope of the world. But we do, we have heavy hearts. As we begin week 13 of this pandemic, as we have just completed this week of fear and pain and violence and outrage and death, our hearts are broken. So we want to begin, O oh God, our Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, with repentance. O oh Lord, we repent now as individuals, as your church, as your community, as a city, and as a nation. We repent of our pride, of our anger, of our injustice, of our oppression, of our racism, of our indifference, of our inaction, and definitely we repent of our judgmentalism. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. O oh Lord God, we come before you bowing down and, and what a privilege it is to worship you in whatever format to be reminded of your goodness, of the mastery of your creation, of the beauty of it, of the breakthrough power, the dunamis of your resurrection, of your victory over death. And so we come before you now offering praise and adoration and thanksgiving. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayers. In your mercy, Lord, we come before you with intercession. 
Lord, we are incapable of healing our land, of healing of our hearts, of turning from the darkness, turning from our sin. We need your healing power. We need your energy. We need your wisdom in our individual hearts and minds and families, certainly in our cities, in our nation, and in our, our world. Oh, Lord God, hear now our prayers for these individuals, these leaders, these students, these young children, these graduates, these family members, these neighbors, and, oh, Lord, hear our prayer for our enemies for those who think, act, feel, react, protest, give, and serve differently from us, hear our prayer now for all of these. And finally, Lord, we do pray this morning for all those who are suffering, suffering not just grief and sadness and depression and mental health, but those who are still suffering uh, from disease, from COVID-19, those in the hospitals, those who are fighting for their lives and for their very breath. We pray for your healing. We pray for the first responders. We pray for doctors and nurses. We pray for hospitality workers. We pray for the hospital cleaning workers. And oh God, we pray that you would forgive us how deeply we ignore the poor. We pray for the poorest of the poor in Africa, in India, in Brazil, and in these places around the world where this virus is ravaging. Oh God, we have made a big, hot mess of things. We pray, oh God, for your authority and for your breath. We need your touch. Give us each courage in this church and around the churches all over the world. Give us each courage to do one brave thing each day this week to represent your kingdom. And we pray now because you taught us to and because your kingdom will come and because your name is hallowed. So hear us now as we pray together saying, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Allison, thank you for leading us in prayer. You know, every time we meet for worship, it is a self Offering. We say that a lot here, but we want to constantly reinforce that. We give of ourselves. When we gather for worship, we give of ourselves when we set aside time to even be watching a webcast of worship. We give of ourselves when we hear God's word and allow the Holy Spirit to speak his truth to us. We give of ourselves in many, many ways. One of those, of course, is intangible gifts. This weekend, the tangible gifts are overwhelming as the food, as we mentioned, kept pouring in and pouring in and pouring in as we were getting ready to go to Bronzeville. But it's also overwhelming to see how this congregation continues to support God's mission in this place. Thank you. Thank you from the depths of our hearts for the way that you are enabling us to continue to be the church. We may not be assembled, but First Presbyterian Church of River Forest is alive and well and serving Jesus Christ. And a lot of that is because of you. So, we encourage you to keep it up. 
We also encourage you, if you know of people who need our assistance, our Benevolence Fund, again, thanks to you, is doing very, very well. And so we would be able to help people. If you can direct people to us who are in need, we are delighted to be whatever we can be of assistance to them. There are many ways to give to First Press. You can go old school and write a check, send it to 7551 Quick Avenue, River Forest, 60305. You can support us by electronic funds transfer, or you can support us by stock transfer. Many people do that. You can support us by going on the website you are currently landed on and going to the Give Online. You can support us, as you see, by text. You can even support us through Amazon Smile. Every cent of the money that you give goes directly to support God's mission. And again, we thank you so much for your generosity and for partnering with us in the mission of Christ emanating from this place. For our offertory music today, we return to our trio of Ben and Lynn Hancock and Abe Miller in a very powerful song, Wasteland. I'm the first one in line to die when the cavalry comes. Yeah, it feels like the great divine has already come. Yeah, I'm wasting my way through death. Losing you along the way.
we sing praise to God the Father. We sing praise to God the Son. We sing praise to God the Spirit. It is God who is for us, who is with us, who can be against us. We have many opportunities to love and serve our God, and those actually begin right after this webcast. If you are listening to this at the worshiping time of 10 o'clock on Sunday morning, we invite you now to take a, just a few moments, uh, get another cup of coffee, get a glass of water, get a stretch break, but join us by Zoom to be hearing a discussion with James Boroshade, who is the 
uh, executive director of Circle Urban Ministries in Austin. He is going to kick off a series of conversations that we want to have with African-American leaders in the greater Chicago area to help us understand what we are working against, the powers, the oppression, the injustice that we are working against. We are not asking them to come and educate us. We need to educate ourselves. We are asking them to come and talk to us and listen to us so that we can have an intelligent conversation and we can be God's well-informed ambassadors in this city in this very difficult time. So we encourage you to uh, click into the Zoom cast that is happening at 11.15 this morning, immediately after this service, with James Borishade. We have many things that are happening. Today is the first day that we have satellite sanctuaries active, and if you are in a satellite sanctuary, uh, air five each other. Just, uh, it's good to have you together, uh, even as it is great to have some folks here together in this room and uh, to be able to be worshiping, looking each other in the eye. Um, one of the things that we are not going to continue this week and following are the Wednesday noon Zoom prayer services. Those were for the season of Easter, and uh, we now are in a different time. We have the opportunity to be gathered together in small groups in other ways. So that is one of the things that we will let go. However, the 915 children's time uh, and also the 11.15 adult time by Zoom will continue. Also, if you have not seen it in your First Press e-news, we are going to be doing Vacation Bible School the week of the 18th of July. We're going to do VBS virtually, and there are many ways that we are going to make this happen for the kids. We're delighted that we can offer this not only to the children of our congregation, but also of the Oak Park, River Forest, surrounding area communities. We're also going to be offering the next level up in that week, uh, Ready, Set, Go, for older elementary students. This we are going to be able to do on site, provided the state of Illinois has moved to phase four by that time. So you could add that to your prayer list, that we will be in a place where the governor and the state will see fit to move us uh, to phase four so that we can have gatherings of up to 50 people and we promise that we will do these things carefully. We promise that we will work within the restrictions offered by the Centers for Disease Control and other health professionals, but we are also very desirous of helping God's people to begin to assemble back together as best we can, and you'll see more about that in the days and the weeks ahead. Now, as Becca has challenged us, we have been commissioned by Christ we have been sent into this world at this time, in this place, to face these challenges, but we do not do that alone. All authority has been given to Christ, who now sends us out in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, but also remember that he is with us day after day after day, right up to the end of the age. And in that knowledge, and in that love, and in that joy, go, do audacious things for God. Amen. <laughs>